It can't do that. Why? Is it We'd have to, we have, we're going to prove that. Well, because what would you do? You'd have to run it on all possible inputs and say it just, you can simulate it, but it could just go forever and you'd never know your answer. If the answer is yes, you'd get the answer yes. The, the number of arguments, but the not the number of arguments, the number of different awesome. inputs that that would be accepted and the thing stops and says yes, yes, yes. Cool That's okay. Um, let's, do, uh, let's do one little thing and then we'll quit today. You may. Um, it seems to me that we've certainly proved that with this particular encoding scheme that finite state machines can't recognize each right. other. Right. But have we, have we proven that there's no possible encoding No, no, no. In fact, there's an easy encoding scheme that, that makes them recognizable by themselves. I'll give you one. Um, why don't we use this encoding scheme that we talked about for a minute? Every finite state machine has a binary number associated with it. Right? Let's order all the finite state machines according to size. Okay? So, so the first one is the smallest one of these string, the smallest number. And I will now renumber all these finite state machines. I'll have the smallest one, I'll call it 0. And the next smallest one, I'll call it 1. And the next smallest one, I'll call 2. So now every single finite state machine has a binary number. And every single binary number is now taken care of. So every binary number in the world now has a finite state machine associated with it. Wouldn't there be two different machines at the same time? I don't think so. No, no, because I'm taking all the finite state machines. You come up with its binary number and just put the, sort them for me. Put them in order, and then renumber them from 0 to infinity in that sorted order. So now they have new labels. And every single number from 0 to infinity is going to be used uh, as a label. So what it, is so that encoding or is that just labeling, though? Because if you, give me, if you give me some super long string, I can't decode it. I have to go look up in an index. What that's it? decoding. It's a, <laughs> admittedly, it uh, may not be a formula. It might actually be a table, but it's computable. It's perfectly fine from a computability point of view. And it's not a wonderful encoding. It's not quite as pretty and simple as this. But I certainly could go through this idea. You give me a string. I reconstruct all the possible finite state machines. I make a table. I count down as many as the string you gave me. And there's the one I want. The table is going to be infinitely long. Yes, it is. And that table is actually an auxiliary memory. So we're no longer really in finite state because we're using an infinite memory. Now, I'm talking about a program doing it right now. I'm talking, uh, as far as actually figuring out which one it is, a computer program would have to do it. But, but a finite state machine is smart enough to just recognize whether it's really one or not, because everyone is. So here's the finite state machine that recognizes legal finite state machines <laughs> in that encoding. It's just that, right? So, so if you're thinking that's kind of a trick, and, it's, and it's, it is a trick, but, but it's normal to make encoding schemes so that every single encoding means something. I could also say this. Here's an even easier way to do it. Use the same encoding we have, right? Any binary string that's not a legitimate finite state machine, I define that to be the finite state machine that accepts nothing. I define that to be this machine. So now every single encoding has a meaning as, as far as a finite state machine goes. It's just semantics. I, so, so if we can do this, then, I mean, how does that jive with your earlier statement that you can't build a finite state machine that can recognize other finite state machines? You can, depending on the encoding. But you can't build finite state machines that can know anything about the other finite state machines. We did prove yesterday that you, don't, that you can't have a finite state machine that accepts other finite state machines that don't accept themselves. That's impossible, no matter what encoding scheme you use. Right. So, so this level, it does depend on the encoding scheme. And it's why compilers work and stuff. And this, I, this encoding can't actually identify the... the no, no, no. Machine. Finite state machines are not smart enough to identify which one. It's right, right. Been oh, yeah. Ugh. Can't do anything. OK. All right, uh, other questions? Um, one, one more topic before we quit today. This is a short topic, and it's self-contained. And I want to squeeze it in today, because I want to start tomorrow scratch on on minimizing finite state machines and get that, get that finished. And this topic connects the trio of regular expressions, deterministic finite state machines, and non-deterministic finite state machines with right 
or let's just call them linear grammars. It adds in a new idea, a new way of looking at sets, a grammar way of looking at sets. As the levels go up, the grammar way of looking at a set becomes at least as important, if not more important, than the machine way of looking at a set. And it really is a different way to look at a set. Seeing it at this level of finite state machines, it's not always presented at this level. It's usually presented at the next level, where it relates to compilers and describing programming languages. But it's really worth seeing it at this level, because it's so easy and transparent at this level to make sense out of it. The best way for me to explain what a linear grammar is not to define it, but to show you an example. So here's an example. Here's a finite state machine, the one that accepts, uh, what does this one do again? Odd number of ones. Okay? Even ones, odd ones. We accept all things with an odd number of ones. I'm going to create a grammar. A grammar is a formalism that doesn't accept or reject things. It generates things. Anything it generates can be spit out. And the things that get rejected by this machine, the grammar won't be able to generate. So the things this machine accepts, the grammar will be able to generate. And the thing the machine rejects, the grammar won't be able to generate. Let me show you what I mean. You have a start symbol. Call it A. Same as this. And you can generate symbols that this machine can accept. Generate strings. You could start with a 0. What do you want to continue with if you start with a 0? You could continue with a 1, but we'll do that next step. You want to continue with something that A can generate again. You could also generate a 1 and then continue with a B. That's all you can do in state A. Generate a 0 and then continue with what something else that A can generate. Generate a 1, continue with something that B can generate. If you're in B, you can generate a 0 and stay in B. Or if you're in B, you can generate a 1 and go back to A. Let's use these. These are called productions. Let's use these productions of this grammar to generate some strings. We're going to get stuck at the very end, and then we'll have to finish up this grammar. Let's start from the start symbol. One of the symbols is indicated as known as the start symbol. It's usually written as S for start, but we used A. Okay, but we have to start from A. So we start from A. What I'm going to write here on the board is called a derivation, a sequence of substitutions in the grammar, one after the other, creating a long derivation. We start with a going to 0a. And now I can substitute for this a. Why don't we substitute uh, 1b for this a? These are the rules. This is a sequence of the rules being applied. So 0, 1, b. <coughs> Let me stop for a second. Who understands so far? Yeah? I'm starting here. I made a substitution. I continue my substitution with A turning into a 1B. And now I continue with a substitution from B. Who can give me a legitimate next step in the derivation? Say it. Who's, who's saying it? Say it again, Michael. 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0, B. That means the B turns into a 0, B. And that's OK. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, Doug. Right. We're going to get stuck because we're not generating anything. We always have these, these capital symbols left there. The capital symbols are called non-terminals. They should not be there at the end. No terminal. They shouldn't be there. The terminal symbols are the symbols in the alphabet. They should be there. The zeros and ones are used as terminal symbols. Capital letters are conventionally used as non-terminal symbols. For this to be a grammar that generates anything, we have to have some way to kind of get rid of the capital letters. Well, which way corresponds to what this machine is doing? The B can disappear. The B can generate nothing, and then we accept whatever we have actually generated symbol-wise to get there. B can go to the empty string. Now that's a grammar. What we're doing here, if you follow this through, A going at 0A, that does this one. And then A going to 1B, that's this next one. And then B going 